please uh, let's uh, welcome Saurabh Chatterjee for his uh, seminar presentation. Okay, uh, so thanks uh, to the organizers for the invitation to this very nice uh, workshop. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a method for lower bounds on um, fluctuations of random variables. Um, so as we know, uh, there are um, there are many ways of getting upper bounds on fluctuations. So this is this broad field of concentration inequalities and variance bounds. Um, but uh, but you know, as I realized while thinking about a question that uh, Yuval Paris asked me, um, and which is part of the talk actually that uh, there are very few methods for lower bounds. So, um, so in fact, um, when I was thinking, I figured that the only ones I know are the following. Uh, so first, you can try to prove some kind of distributional convergence, a central limit theorem. So that's great if you can do that. Uh, then you have upper and lower bounds matching everything that you want. If you cannot do that, uh, then you prove a lower bound on the variance. So there are some techniques for getting lower bounds on the variance. Um, but you have to also prove a matching upper bound on some higher moment um, to apply this second moment method. So just a lower bound on the variance doesn't tell you um, that the fluctuations are of the, that order. Okay. Uh, there is a coupling method due to Swanti Janssen, which I didn't know. So I, after I wrote my preprint, I sent it to um, Mike Steele, who told me about uh, this. Um, so Swanti Janssen has an idea, um, has, a, has a lemma which he used uh, with Bela Bolabash to prove um, um, a lower bound on the fluctuations of uh, the longest increasing subsequence before you know, everything was known about it. So, um, uh, so there, is, there is a method. Uh, and then there are problem-specific methods. So there are various papers that have been written. Um, and so you get a survey of all of these uh, in my uh, preprint, which is on archive now. Um, however, um, as I was thinking about this question that Yuval asked me, uh, I realized that you know there are many other open questions. That's not the only one, and there are many modern problems where none of these uh, methods work. Okay, so I, I tried um, in various things; it didn't work. Uh, so I'll um, tell you about a new method uh, with applications to the following things: you know, first passage percolation then you know, traveling salesman and minimum, minimum matching, and the random assignment problem, uh, some spin glasses, and you know, finally, uh, for this you know, workshop, a uh, little bit of application to random matrices. Okay, so, um, so, okay. Um, so first, uh, what is meant by a lower bound on the order of fluctuations? If a lower bound on the variance doesn't tell you, then, then what does? And the most sensible way to uh, talk about lower bounds on fluctuations is through the, this notion of Levy concentration functions. Um, so if you, if you have a random variable x, uh, its Levy concentration functions defined as, as follows, f of some number h is a probability that x belongs to an interval of length h, and you take supreme over all, all intervals. Okay, that's the Levy concentration function. And we'll say that a sequence of random variables xn has fluctuations of order at least delta n, so the, here's a sequence, delta n is another sequence, if there is some positive constant so that the limb soup of fn c delta n uh, is strictly less than one. Okay. So otherwise you can find the sequence of intervals of length of order delta n so that the um, random variable, um, or actually little o of delta n, so that the random variable belongs to these intervals with probability tending to one. So the fluctuations are much smaller than delta n. So this is the notion, uh, this is the sense in which I define um, uh, the notion that uh, a random sequence of random variables has fluctuations of order at least delta n if, um, if this happens. Okay, any questions about this? Okay. All right, so now that we have fixed uh, one notion of, um, you know, se uh, you know, a sensible notion of um, um, fluctuations of random variables, here is the main lemma, um, and the proof is very simple, so I'll show it in one slide. Uh, the lemma is the following. So suppose x and y are two random variables defined on the same probability space. Then for any interval a, b, the chance that x belongs to a, b is bounded by half times this, one plus the chance that x minus y is less than b minus a, plus the total variation distance between law of x and law of y. Okay? So the idea 
is that you want to show that probability x belongs to an interval i is uniformly bounded away from 1 for all intervals of, of length bounded by some delta. If you want to show that, you construct another random variable y so that the total variation distance between the law of x and the law of y is small. And <coughs> x minus y is at least delta apart. Okay. If you can do these two things, and here small doesn't mean going to zero. Small just means that the sum has to be less than one, so that this whole thing is bounded away from one. Um, so, so to show that a random variable x has fluctuations of a certain order, you just have to construct a random variable, another random variable y on the same probability space, so that the total variation distance between the laws of these two random variables is small, but they are uh, far apart. You know, they're, they're apart by at least delta with some substantial chance. Okay, that's all you have to do. Okay, so, so as I mentioned, there's this coupling technique due to Swanti Janssen, um, and there's a similar approach, but uh, in Janssen's lemma, he takes y so that the law of x and the law of y are exactly the same, and this lemma gives you, you know, somehow gives you much more flexibility, as we'll see. You know, why, why do I have the total variation distance um, instead of something else like the Bayer scene, uh, you know, the Kolmogorov distance or something like that? Th there are specific reasons. There is a, there's a distinct advantage of using the total variation distance. Okay, so we'll talk about that. Any questions about the statement of the lemma? Okay, so as I said, the proof is, is very simple. Um, uh, you take the inter any interval, a, b, call it i, then one is bigger than or equal to the chance that x belongs to i or y belongs to i, which by inclusion exclusion, you have this. Now, the probability that y, uh, y belongs to i is at least the probability x belongs to i minus the total variation distance. So, in case there are some students here who don't know what's the total variation distance, if you have two probability measures, mu and nu, the total variation distance is the following. You take any event a, mu a minus nu a, take the difference of the probability of a under mu minus the probability of a under nu, and absolute value takes supremum over all events a. That's the total variation distance between two probability measures. So from the definition, it's clear that this is the case. And also, this intersection probability is bounded above by the chance that x minus y is less than the length of this interval. Because if they are both in this interval, then the difference is bounded by the length of the interval. So if you substitute these two inequalities in here, you get this, which is just what I wrote down in the previous slide. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so Kolmogorov distance would be fine too, but you know, there is a reason you know why I'm using total variation. So we'll see. Yeah, you could have substituted total variation with Kolmogorov distance. That that would be fine too. Okay. So here, let's see a quick example. Okay, very quickly before going into any kind of complexity. Um, suppose you have x1 to x and iid Bernoulli half random variables, and s is the sum. We all know it has fluctuations of order square root n. Can we get a lower bound um, using this method? Okay. So what you do is the following. You define xi prime to be equal to xi with probability 1 minus alpha times 1 over root n, where alpha will be, will be chosen later on, and xi prime to be exactly 1 with probability one, uh, alpha times 1 over root n. So xi prime is either xi or it's 1. So, so you, you, you know, for a small fraction, you know, for a 1 over root n fraction, um, you kind of set it to be equal to one, randomly. Now, the nice thing about the total variation distance, so Sn prime is the sum of these Xi primes, the nice thing about the total variation distance is, is that it has a, this projection property. So the law of Sn, the law of Sn prime are complicated objects. You know, you need the central limit theorem to understand those, or you know, at least the binomial theorem. Um, but, but, the, but since these are functions of these random vectors, you can bound it above by the total variation distance between the laws of these two random vectors. And that's much easier to compute. The, you know, these two probability measures can be explicitly written down, and there's a formula for the total variation distance between probability measures in terms of differences of probabilities, and you sum them up over all atoms. And you can compute, so this xi prime is different from xi at roughly root n places, but still, uh, the nice thing, and we'll see the reason why this is true, uh, so this isn't, this isn't exact computation, this is just a little bit of analysis. You write down the whole thing, you do a little bit of analysis, and you just have to use Chebyshev's inequality, nothing more, uh, to do this upper bound. 
But its upper bound doesn't depend on n. It's just some universal constant times alpha. Okay, where this alpha was this alpha here. Okay, so if you do this computation, you don't do it now, but you know, if you do this computation, you'll see that uh, you know, this, is, uh, this is bounded by constant times alpha. On the other hand, you see what's happening between Sn prime and Sn. So Sn was sum of x1 to xn. Now you chose one over, uh, you know, chose roughly root n of these um, of these xi's, and you set them to be equal to one. Okay. Now when you're setting them to be equal to one, some of them, half of them, are already one, but the but the other half are zero. So you are increasing by root n. So you're increasing Sn by root n when you when you're going from Sn to Sn prime. So Sn prime minus Sn is a order root n. Okay. Because you are increasing them in this artificial manner. So therefore, by this lemma. For any interval of width less than root n times alpha, the chance that Sn belongs to i is bounded by half times one plus this total variation distance plus this probability. And this probability we know that is going to zero. Uh, you know, C2 was chosen in this manner. So if alpha is chosen small enough, this is uniformly bounded away from zero, uh, from one. Okay. So, so choosing alpha small enough, this right side can be made uniformly bounded away from one, and this shows that Sn has fluctuations of order at least root n. Okay? The only thing I didn't show you is this calculation, but we'll see how to do that in, in greater generality, this, this kind of total variation calculation. Any questions? Okay. This is the, this is the Basic example, just to give you an idea of how this is done. So you, you, you construct something which is substantially away from your original thing, but yet it is done in such a manner that total variation distance is not too much. It's kind of small. OK, so, so let us now see how to get this optimal lower bound and the fluctuations of the length of the optimal tour in the traveling salesman problem. So I'll, you know, this is a much harder example. And we'll you know, slowly go through the steps. So the traveling salesman problem, again, if somebody here doesn't know, so you have, uh, well, the stochastic traveling salesman problem, you have n random points on the plane according to some distribution, IAD points, and you want to find a tour through these points. So there's a, tra a salesman who is traveling, you know, from, uh, has to travel to all of these cities, and he has to have a tour where uh, he starts, he ends at where he started from, and has to minimize the total distance traveled, okay? So that's the length of the optimal tour. And, uh, and then you ask about the fluctuations of that. So this can be in two dimensions. It can also be in d dimensions. Okay. Um, so, so there are a few steps to, to this. And these are systematic steps. So we'll see you know, how the, whatever I'm outlining carries over to many other problems. It's not just for this one. So the first thing is this Hellinger affinity. Uh, let mu and mu prime be two probability measures in the same space with densities f and g with respect to some probability measure nu. And of course, nu can be mu plus mu prime over two, so you can always find a probability measure with respect to which these are both absolutely continuous. So suppose these have two densities, then the Hellinger affinity between mu and mu prime is defined as the integral of square root fg d nu. And by Cauchy's words, this is bounded between zero and one. Okay? And the closer it is to one, the closer these two measures are mu and mu prime. And one can show that uh, this quantity doesn't depend on the choice of this measure nu. So this is independent of that. That's called the Hellinger affinity. Now, why is this useful? Suppose you have measures mu1 to mu n, mu1 prime to mu n prime. And you take these two product measures. Mu is mu1 cross up to mu n. Mu, pr mu prime is mu1 prime cross up to mu prime. Then this bound. Uh, is uh, very well known to statisticians. It has been used very effectively in theoretical statistics. The total variation distance between uh, probability measures, these product probability measures, which are complicated objects, can be bounded by something which is a much simpler object. So you take these individual mu i and mu, mu i prime, take the Hellinger affinity between them, squared them, take the product, one minus that, the square root is a bound on the total variation distance between mu and mu prime. It's very easy, it's just Cauchy-Schwartz, but you know, it's slightly tricky, you have to carry out the argument. But, um, but the nice thing about using the Selinger affinity is that uh, it allows you to get bounds on total variation distance based on um, simple computations that you can do for the individual 
measures. Okay. So this is one other reason why I'm using total variation. Okay. Um, now let x be a d-dimensional random vector with probability density function e to the minus vx on either rd or on the positive orthand, um, zero infinity to the d. And suppose v is a smooth function satisfying some mild growth conditions, which allows you know, x to be a Gaussian or exponential random variable or many other things, but not uniform. So uniform, if you have uniform on interval, v has to be infinity at some points, and this is, that is not allowed. Um, and take some... Now it has stopped working. Okay. Uh, take some epsilon um, and let y be x over 1 plus epsilon. So you scale down y by, by a small factor. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is you know, the only ugly thing that you will see. But uh, so you take the law of x and law of y. So you take this x is a random vector, y is a scaling of x by 1 plus epsilon. And when you do the computation of the Hellinger affinity, you can write down, so this is the density of uh, y, this is the density of x. You can write these things down, do a Taylor expansion, while well, you have to justify all the steps, of course, but uh, I'm showing this roughly. Um, you do, do, do a first order Taylor expansion, you get 1 plus epsilon d over 2, and here you get, this, expanding this, you get 1 minus epsilon over 2 something. And then you just apply integration by parts, and kind of like magic, uh, the epsilon terms goes away. So the Ellinger affinity is at least 1 minus c times epsilon squared. And that's, that's very important somehow. So when you take uh, a random vector, uh, d-dimensional random vector with a smooth density, um, and you do this uh, scaling by 1 plus epsilon, and take the Hellinger affinity between the laws of the two things, it's bounded below by 1 minus constant times epsilon squared, not epsilon. It, this is not true if, if, for instance, x was uniformly distributed in a cube. Then this is no longer true. It's the smooth density that, that matters over here. Okay? Okay? And then from this, now it's very easy to derive. If suppose x1 to xn are iid with density satisfying some conditions as above, and yi's are scalings of epsilon by 1 plus epsilon i. The total variation distance between the laws of these two random vectors is bounded by c times square root of uh, summation epsilon i squared. Okay, and this is what um, allows you to get what you want. Um, so some of the same thing was at play in the Bernoulli example also. Um, so so th their epsilon was one over root n. It was not smooth. It was a somewhat different setup. But epsilon is 1 over root n, so it is 1 over root n perturbation of the original Bernoulli. But the 1 over root n gets squared, and that's why when you sum from 1 to n, you get something that doesn't depend on n anymore. Okay, so that's kind of what, what mattered. If you compute the Hellinger affinity between you know, xi and xi prime in that example, and you applied this lemma, then you would get this result. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, so now you have this. So you have the x1 to xn points in, the, in Rd. You have slight scaling of those things, and you get total variation distance bound. Uh, okay, so now a general class of geometric optimization problems. Uh, so suppose you have a function which takes in n d-dimensional vectors and outputs a real number, and it has this homogeneity property. It's a homogeneous function. So if you take fn of lambda x1 to lambda xn, it becomes lambda to the r, so r is some fixed number, times fn of x1 to xn. And you know, surprising number of very complicated functions can be put into this framework. So for instance, if you take the length of the optimal traveling salesman path, it satisfies this with r equals 1. So if you take all these points and just scale them down a little, you know, it's, this, it's the original length times that scaling. So, and similarly, you know, the minimum matching and the volume of convex hull and you know, all kinds of things have this, have this property. So let xi be these random vectors and ln be this function. And what's the general lower bound on the order of fluctuations of ln? So here is the theorem. Let tn be a sequence of constants so that limit of probability ln bigger than tn is positive. So tn is somehow a lower bound on the size of ln. Okay? So tn is a sequence of constants, so the chance that ln is bigger than tn is not going to zero through any subsequence. So, um, uh, so the limit is positive. Okay? Then ln has fluctuations of order n to the minus half times tn. 
So roughly speaking, in all of these problems which have this homogeneity property that I wrote down here, the fluctuations uh, are of order at least 1 over root n times the size of the, of the object. So the fluctuation of the traveling salesman would be at least 1 over root n times the length of the traveling salesman path. The fluctuation of minimum matching would be at least 1 over root n times the length of the minimum matching. Okay. The question is whether it, this gives you a sensible answer. Yeah, that's, the, that's the question. So it gives a lower bound by this, by this machinery. Uh, well, just a word about the proof. It's, it's very simple. It's using the lemma. So you take the original points x1 to xn. You scale them down by 1 plus alpha over root n. So just a little bit of scaling. And then ln prime, due to the homogeneity property, uh, ln prime, the new optimal length, is the, just the scaling of the original length. And if ln is at least tn, then you get a lower bound of the difference between ln and ln, ln prime, which is like 1 over root n times tn. On the other hand, by the proposition that we proved, the total variation distance between the two laws is bounded by some constant times alpha. It does depend on n. So it can be made small by choosing alpha small. And then the, uh, apply just the lemma. Uh, so that, that if you take any interval of length, um, 1 over root n times tn, um, this lemma will tell you that choosing alpha small enough, the probability is uniformly bounded away from 1. So the proof is very simple. Once you're given this whole thing, uh, this, first of all, this lemma, and secondly, this, um, this total variation bound uh, using the Hellinger affinity, uh, it's, uh, it's just a few lines. Okay. Okay. Any questions about the, this proof? So, so just to recap, um, we have these IID points in RD. We have some function which has this homogeneity property. Let's say if you scale all the points by lambda, then the result will also be scaled by lambda. It can be a very complicated function. And then this argument says that um, the fluctuations of, this, of the output are at least of order 1 over root n times the size of the output. Okay? So let's see what this gives. So suppose you, ln is either the length of the optimal traveling salesman path or ln is the length of the minimum matching, you know, either of these two. Um, um, in both cases, the size of ln is of order n to the 1 minus 1 over d. And the reason is very simple. It, it is a well-known result. It's because the nearest neighbor distance in d dimensions is n to the minus 1 over d. And both of these things are lower bounded, at least, by the sum of nearest neighbor distances times some constant. So, so that's why you get n to the 1 minus 1 over d. So you can take tn to be 1, n to the 1 minus 1 over d. So the theorem says that the fluctuations of a, are of order at least n to the minus half times n to the 1 minus 1 over d, which gives you this. And it is known that, at least for densities with compact support, which unfortunately doesn't include this you know, unbounded densities, um, this is the right order. So, so I, surprisingly, unbounded densities, uh, you know, there are, I, I didn't see any results and I asked around and I couldn't find anything. Um, but presumably, you know, if the densities are falling off fast enough, then you can apply this kind of technique and uh, you can get the same rate. Um, so so this, this seemingly uh, kind of, I, I don't know if I should say, call it crude, but you know, th this technique ends up giving it this, result which seems like the right, right, uh, right result is n to the d minus 2 over 2d. Okay. Um, yeah, so I have not seen. So this is actually, an, I think it is, you know, it's an open problem. Um, it's an open problem because if you just have want to apply Efron Stein kind of bounds directly, you would get infinities. You know? So it's, it, 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 there, there, there is something. You know, otherwise, I would have just done it. Okay. So. Um, uh, the only previous result I know is due, due to Wansu Rui, uh, who proved this order one. So in dimension two, it's order one. You see d minus two is zero. Uh, uh, Rui proved the order one lower bound uh, for traveling salesman through uniformly distributed points in the unit square. And you know, just for completeness, I generalize this to d dimensions for uniformly distributed points. It requires a different coupling, this kind of very simple coupling and that I showed. It, it's, it won't work. Um, for minimum matching on, on a compact set, I think the question of the lower bound is, is open. So I'll, I'll mention it again in the list of open problems. Okay. okay. 
Okay, so now, uh, you know, I'll not show you any more proofs. I'll ju just show some results that I, that I have in this paper. Uh, so this is the problem that motivated this whole research, this question that you've all asked. Uh, it's about two-dimensional first passage percolation. So if you're not familiar with the model, um, uh, so you have each edge, each nearest neighbor edge in uh, the two-dimensional lattice is, is assigned a random weight. The weights are non-negative in IID. And the weight of a path is the sum of the edge weights along the path. And the first passage time from x to y, from vertex x to vertex y, is the minimum weight over all paths from x to y. So you take all paths, each path has a weight, minimize over all paths, and that's the first passage um, time, dxy. Okay, so is the, is the model clear to everybody? Uh, the question is, one of the main questions in this area is what is the order of fluctuations of dxy depending on this distance between x and y, in particular if the distance becomes bigger, bigger you know, goes to infinity, what's the order of fluctuations? And we know very little about that, although a lot of work has been done, a very you know, deep work has been done. Um, so the best known upper bound um, is uh, the distance divided by the log of the distance square root, best known upper bound on the order of fluctuations. And this comes as a result of works of various authors. So Keston proved it without the log, Benjamin Nicolai and Schramm proved it with the log for binary weights, and th these were extended later to much more general class of weights by these other authors. The lower bound, on the other hand, <laughs> you know, is, is in much worse shape. Uh, so Newman and Pisa showed that um, the variance of TXY is bounded below by some constant times log of the distance. Okay. However, this does not prove, so this is the question that you've all asked me. So this does not prove a lower bound on the order of fluctuations because the upper bound doesn't match. So just a lower bound on the variance you cannot use to say it has fluctuations of order at least square root log of the distance. Um, so Pimandel and Perez, they proved an actual lower bound. Um, they actually showed this fluctuations of order square root log n, but only if the weights are exponentially distributed. And the Expo you know, the memoryless property of the exponential was crucially used in this proof. So it doesn't, the, it doesn't seem to extend beyond uh, the exponential distribution. And then using the, the techniques of this, uh, this paper that I, uh, that I just showed, uh, you, can sh you can actually show this, that for a large class of distributions, uh, the fluctuations are actually of order at least square root log of the distance. Okay, you just have to take these original edge weights and you scale them, but the scaling depends now on the distance of the edge from the origin. That's, you know, the, so you have to cleverly choose the scaling, and then this result falls out of this, this technique. Okay. So more on first passage percolation. So first, any, any questions about this? Um, yeah, so the coupling is, Okay, I can tell, tell a little bit about the coupling. So, um, um, so, so you, take, um, you take a point at distance n from the origin, and you, have, you want to show that the first passage time from zero to that point has fluctuations of order at least square root log n. So you take a ball of radius n over two around zero, and take each edge weight, call the edge weight we. You replace we by one, uh, uh, we over one plus some factor, where this factor is uh, one over the distance of the edge from the origin times square root log n. So, so you, you do an inhomogeneous perturbation. And with that perturbation, it turns out that total version distance as before is bounded by something that doesn't depend on n, and we can, which you can make smaller, small by choosing a parameter small enough. And on the other hand, uh, the uh, first passage time um, has to decrease by at least square root log n. Okay, so this coupling, uh, gives you this. So somehow, you know, this kind of coupling doesn't seem to work in high dimensions higher than two. So maybe there is some other more clever coupling that can work in three and higher dimensions. I don't know. Um, but uh, so this, uh, th this is just a perturbative coupling. And then you use the rest of the things, the, the Hellinger affinity and all the other, other, other things. Uh, but the coupling is inhomogeneous. So you, you, um, you know, the, the weights depend, uh, vary inversely as the distance of the edge from the origin. Okay. Uh, here, the conjecture is uh, in two dimensions, it's x minus y, the distance to the one third. That's the conjecture. Distance to the one third. And as I said, the best known upper bound is distance over the log of the distance, uh, square root of that. 
And um, yeah, so, so even showing little o of that, you know, Bourguin told me he tried for a long time to prove little o of that. Uh, so, you know, that would be a big step to prove, uh, you know, little o of n over log n with that. And, you know, many other people. Okay. Uh, okay, so the next thing is shape fluctuations in first pass percolation. So let Bt be the set of all vertices that can be reached by time t. All x so that t0x is less than or equal to t. Okay? And there is a result, you know, following works by Richardson and various other people, uh, there's a result of Cox and Durette, uh, where they show that there is a symmetric convex set B0, uh, so that almost surely for every epsilon, uh, Bt over t, if you take this all points which can reach by time t scale that's set by 1 over t. Um, uh, well, you have to you know, kind of fuzz it a little bit to make it a subset of uh, Rd. Uh, and then um, it's between 1 minus epsilon times b0 and 1 plus epsilon times b0. So there's a limit shape. So the shape of the region that, is, that can be reached by time t approaches a limit if you scale it by t. So b0 is called the limit shape. And the fluctuations of this object, 1 over t bt, are called shape fluctuations. And Newman and Pisa defined this uh, shape fluctuation exponent, which is naturally you know, um, uh, indicated by this, uh, this theorem here. Uh, this uh, is the smallest kappa, so that uh, bt is contained in t minus t to the kappa b0 and contained in t plus t to the kappa b0 for all large t almost surely. Okay, so the smallest kappa. So, the, uh, so th this gives a... Uh, measure on how much uh, this bt fluctuates from the predicted limit shape, okay, this exponent. Uh, and it has been an open problem, actually, to show that this cap, uh, chi prime, this exponent, is positive in any dimension. Uh, this, um, you know, so this is, this is the most natural thing you can define to, to understand the fl uh, shape fluctuations. So what follows from uh, these arguments is that in 2D first passage percolation, under some mild condition of the edge weight distributions, chi prime is at least one eighth. Okay. Um, the main step is to show that there is a direction in which the first passage time to a point at distance n has fluctuations of order at least n to the one eighth. And as I mentioned before, in this paper, Newman and Pisa, they, they also did the same thing, they, but they got a variance lower bound of order n to the one fourth uh, in some direction. However, since it does not give an actual lower bound on the order of fluctuations, this cannot be used to get a lower bound in chi prime. And it's conjectured, um, again, uh, to answer Sylvia's question, it's conjectured that chi prime is one third. Okay. In two dimensions, in 2D. Okay. Yes. No, no, because uh, it doesn't need an assumption because there is always the direction of curvature. You see, so this is a, this is a fluctuation of the whole shape. So, so if there is a direction of curvature, it, that's sufficient to guarantee that you know, the BT cannot be in a very thin band. 